Porsche earned its reputation by building high-performance vehicles that appeal to demanding drivers. Drivers looking for sleek, aerodynamic, fast cars find they can take the wheel of a Porsche and conquer the most demanding roads. Knowing the racing heritage of these cars, it's easy to let your mind drift as you dream of competing at Le Mans or challenging the sands of Dakar. All Porsches share a common legacy of automotive innovation, no matter where they're driven. A legacy that began with the company's namesake, Dr. Ferdinand Porsche, early in the 20th century. Throughout his career, Porsche and his cars would lead the way. His designs were first noticed on Europe's roads as he developed several sporty vehicles for major German manufacturers. Starting in 1924, when Porsche took over for designer-in-chief Paul Daimler at Mercedes, he began to create a series of fast, supercharged cars. These powerful and sporty models set the Mercedes drivers apart from the crowd. His most famous creations, the SS and SSK supercharged cars for Mercedes, were equally at home on the road or on the track. These cars had a low center of gravity that aided handling and lightweight but powerful engines. The superchargers tripled the amount of air going into the carburetor and pushed performance up to 300 horsepower. This was tremendous power for that time. Today, these cars have become collector's favorites. Porsche's next project was designing a prototype car for Wanderer. This car was never mass produced and Wanderer soon merged with four other companies to form Auto Union. After the Wanderer, he began to work on a new high-powered racing engine. This engine would form the basis for a series of revolutionary Grand Prix race cars, the Outer Union Silver Arrows. Like latter-day Porsches, these cars placed the engine behind the passenger compartment instead of in the front. And they were aerodynamic. They're considered to be the first modern race cars, far more advanced than anything else on the road at the time. These cars looked futuristic, but the combination of a mid-engine and independent suspension made them hard to handle. But especially skilled drivers like Bernd Rosemeyer and Tazio Nuvolari learned to control the cars. Outer Union and the Mercedes team dominated European Grand Prix racing in the 1930s. Backing both teams was a state subsidy from Adolf Hitler. Outer Union would not have received the financial aid if it wasn't for Porsche's personal plea. Hitler was impressed by the confident and brilliant engineer. Several years later, in 1938, he asked Porsche to help produce the Volkswagen, or people's car. The Porsche team threw itself into the work of designing and building this affordable, easy to repair family car. They created an inexpensive automobile that could easily cruise the newly built autobahns at 60 miles per hour. Always interested in speed, Porsche thought about a sports car based on the Volkswagen. He convinced the government to give him the money to build two prototypes, the 60K10s. These cars were built for a race from Berlin to Rome. They were finished and set to go by the end of the summer of 1939. The cars were ready, but in September of 1939, Hitler launched another race, a blitzkrieg into Poland. The world was at war. Ferdinand Porsche was named president of the Armour Commission of the Ministry of Arms and Munitions. He went to work developing tanks and other military vehicles. To protect the company from Allied bombing attacks, it was split into three groups. 
One was set up in a remote Austrian farming community, Gmund. This workshop would serve as the haven from which Porsche and his son Ferry would relaunch their car business after the war. Their first big post-war break came from a former member of the Outer Union team, Tazio Nuvolari. He wanted them to create a new Grand Prix car. This collaboration produced a stunning and advanced race car, the Cisitalia. Ferry Porsche was pleased with the results, and it inspired him to resurrect his father's plans for a Volkswagen-based sports car. In June of 1947, work started on this car, the first Porsche, the Type 356. The earliest Porsches took the Volkswagen pan, transmission and engine, modified them, and wrapped these borrowed components into a hand-built, streamlined aluminum body. Using Volkswagen parts, Porsche was able to keep its costs down while working on developing the refinements that would make the car stand out. The car's basic design owed a styling debt to the pre-war 60K10 race cars, but it was more refined and modern. The curvy, fluid, sexy lines gave the impression of having been conceived in a wind tunnel. In fact, there was no money for that. The shape was pure designer's intuition. The car was beautiful, but launching a new car company was risky. It would take a lot of hard work to ensure success. Starting in 1948, Ferry Porsche took the car to various European motor shows where it was noticed by the press. Ferdinand Porsche had long dreamed of producing a world-class sports car. Finally, it was coming true, but in 1951, he died just as his cars began to triumph around the world. Ferry looked to an American, Max Hoffman, to help him grow the company by introducing the car to sports car fans in the United States. America was the land of low-cost, giant cars in the post-war era. Expecting to sell small sports cars in the American market seemed like a long shot. However, Ferry knew there was a passion in the United States for the small British MG sports cars. He hoped to capitalize on that interest. Hoffman thought he should redesign the car to make it look more like the MG. Although Ferry resisted, Hoffman agreed to represent the cars. The Porsche 356 offered more performance and style than the MG. It was more fun to drive and more reliable, although more expensive. It began to find a niche by 1954, Hoffman was selling 11 cars a week, 30% of the factory's output. The car's design could add a little excitement to driving. The engine in the rear shifted the weight distribution, which could cause the car's back end to come loose during a turn. Drivers had to have a fast pair of wrists and a great seat of the pants feel for driving. It was a test of skill. Some said, if you could drive a Porsche, you could drive anything. To spur demand, Ferry began to enter modified production cars into racing events. The 356s achieved a number of racing successes in Europe and in North America, including class wins at Le Mans in 1951 and 1952. By the mid-1950s, Porsche was able to develop cars built primarily for racing, the 550 series Spiders. These lightweight, open-topped two-seaters with aluminum bodies sitting on a tubular frame were spectacular and fast. In 1955, Porsche was ready to take the new Spiders to the 24-hour race at Le Mans. Ferry Porsche had high hopes for the factory team that would be competing against the world's best cars and drivers. Over 250,000 spectators gathered to watch Europe's classic sports race. They were thrilled watching the cars break records at every lap. 
the Porsche team was able to capture two class wins and came close to an overall victory. The Spiders became the dominant car in the sports car class around the world. Success on the track stimulated demand for the quick little Spiders, including from celebrities. Ladies and gentlemen, James Dean. Hi, Jimmy. Hi, Iggy. We asked Jimmy over today because he's a racing man himself. In 1955, the young actor, James Dean, known for his love of fast cars, joined the spider buying bandwagon. With his new $6,000 spider capable of hitting 150 miles per hour, Dean became a fixture at weekend races in California. Although he wasn't really trained as a racer, he drove that car in several events and proved to be quite talented. In the fall of 1955, he set out from Los Angeles for a race in Northern California. The setting sun blinded Dean as he drove. He didn't see a Ford sedan pull out into an intersection. His car collided with the other car. Dean was killed instantly. As the 50s came to an end, it was clear that the 356 needed a makeover to keep its appeal. Ferry's son, Bootsy, took responsibility for designing the new body. In 1963, the new 901 debuted at the Frankfurt Auto Show. Peugeot claimed it owned the rights to car names with three digits and a zero in the middle, so Porsche changed the name to the 911. The car's configuration was similar to the 356. Its engine was still in the rear and was air-cooled. However, it was more powerful since it had six cylinders instead of four. This gave the new car a top speed of about 130 miles per hour. One thing the company lacked was an open roadster model of the 911. Safety concerns were mounting, so the designers developed an open car with a built-in roll bar. They called it the Targa. The 1967 Targa was a hit, but Porsche owners would have to wait until 1983 for a true cabriolet. The late 1960s saw the creation of a seminal Porsche, the 908. After a shaky start in the 1968 Daytona 500 and a close defeat at Le Mans, the 908 started winning. It won enough races to earn the company its first world manufacturer's title in 1969. The 908 led to the development of one of the most famous Porsche racing cars, the 917. The 917 is considered to be the most important historic racing Porsche. It first hit the track in 1969 with a four and a half liter, 550 horsepower, 12 cylinder engine. The 917 gave Porsche its second consecutive World Manufacturers Championship. And in 1970, its first outright Le Mans victory. Porsche created 25 of the costly cars so they would qualify as a production model. Some said the only thing they had in common with a production car was that they had a wheel at each corner. The 908's 220 plus miles per hour top speed created the biggest initial problem with the cars. The rear end would lift and the cars would be hard to steer. The problem was fixed by reshaping the tail into an upraised wedge. Once the aerodynamic fix was developed, the car began to dominate the tracks of Europe. Its main rival, the Ferrari 512, was a fearsome competitor. But in 1971, Porsche scored another Le Mans victory. The stunning back-to-back -back triumphs at Le Mans helped to earn the car its legendary status. Porsche continued racing on all the major tracks of the world and in some offbeat venues. In the late 1970s, the company saw its cars entered into extreme endurance rallies. The 911s were being taken off-road and pushed to see how sure-footed they were. 
some decided to challenge racing's outer limits, Africa. People took the 911s into the toughest environments to test themselves and the cars. In 1986, Porsche's new limited edition four-wheel drive 959 entered the Paris-Dakar rally, the ultimate Mad Max-like event across the untamed African interior. Some thought taking the reformulated 911 into this inhospitable environment would be a nightmare. This is a race for rough and tumble off-road vehicles, not refined sports cars. But surprisingly, the Porsches became the first sports cars to win. While racing put the company in the headlines, some of the developments for the track found their way into the street cars. The turbocharged racing engines gave rise to blisteringly fast turbo Carreras in 1975. These 160 miles per hour cars stood out with wide flared fenders, fat tires and spoilers. They were the fastest production cars on the road. By the early 1980s, Ferry felt it was time to turn the company over to a new management team. This group of designers and engineers began to explore new versions of the 911. They even started to experiment with four-wheel drive. In 1989, their design program led to what some of the motoring press dubbed the best Porsche ever. The $75,000 Carrera 4 had a new enclosed chassis that minimized wind resistance and a revolutionary four-wheel drive system coupled to a 240-horsepower, 3.6-liter motor. The aerodynamic body and undercarriage easily slid through the wind as the speedometer reached 160 miles per hour. While high-powered Porsches were revving up pulses, a smaller and inexpensive throwback to the early days of sports cars started to turn heads in 1989, the Mazda MX-5, or Miata, as it was known in the States. Mazda hit a nerve with this car. It was affordable, costing under $20,000, and fun to drive. It didn't take extraordinary skill to handle these cars, but knowledgeable drivers could also have fun with them. Miata fever spread. Soon, more fun little roadsters from several manufacturers appeared on the streets. It was a craze. Porsche's management decided they needed their own entry-level roadster. They came up with the Porsche 986, the Boxster. It was an instant hit. It was released in Europe in late 1996 and in the US at the LA Auto Show in January of 1997. The car's shape was inspired by the early Type 356 and the classic 550 Spiders. The heart of the Boxster is a six-cylinder Boxer engine. While it's mid-engined, the designers positioned it to make the car well-balanced yet agile. Sales were brisk for the $40,000 plus cars, but some reviewers and customers complained that it didn't have enough power. Porsche reacted by beefing up the motor with 25 more horsepower and did some other tweaking to the engine that took about a second off the zero to 60 time. They called the Braunier car the Boxster S. The increased speed and other options pushed the price up about $10,000 but Porsche fans did not seem to be phased. However, people inside the company knew its reputation still rested on the flagship 911. Work began on an all new car for the 21st century. There had not been a complete redesign of its most popular classic since 1963. The car had 35 years of history and legions of loyal buyers that had to be satisfied. The designer's challenge was to produce a car that was in keeping with its heritage, but also a car ready for the next millennium. 
With everything riding on public reaction, the result was presented to the public in 1997. Visually, it was unmistakably a Porsche 911, and people responded to the modern makeover. The use of a water-cooled rather than the traditional air-cooled engine shocked some diehards, but they were won over by the performance. It was all Porsche. The new 911 grew into a full line of vehicles, including a turbo, a Targa, and a GT. The primary model included a top-down cabriolet that gave Porsche owners that classic open-top feel. It was a balance between luxury and dynamic driving. The 315 horsepower engine was the most powerful, normally aspirated model ever offered. Its output was enhanced with new electronics that helped to increase power while reducing emissions. The new engine propelled the car from zero to 60 in just five seconds. To keep these wickedly fast cars under control, the four-wheel independent suspension was augmented by an onboard computer stability management system. Loss of tire grip at the front or rear triggers an automatic application of braking to individual wheels or alters engine power to keep things steady. For those drivers who wanted a little more dynamic handling capability, the Carrera 4S was created with an all-wheel drive system. While the 911 was still the image leader, the company couldn't ignore the popularity of sports utility vehicles. And in 2003, the Cayenne, an SUV with a name taken from a hot chili pepper, joined the Porsche stable. Porsche said the spicy 450 horsepower vehicle was the first SUV that could truly be described as sporty. Its zesty V8 engine propelled it from zero to 60 in a little over five seconds. The Cayenne brought Porsche a more rounded product lineup, a wider range for its fans to enjoy. Porsche won't just rely on an SUV to spice things up. There's a commitment to creating new, innovative, and fast sports cars for Porsche fans. They have to, since for some owners, Porsche has become a way of life. Owners clubs have sprouted up all over the world. Weekend rallies, performance driving schools, and organized trips that take advantage of the car's capabilities have created an international Porsche community. Collectors may argue endlessly about which model is the ultimate expression of the Porsche heritage. But whatever their opinion, what is clear is that Porsche created a legacy of uncommon and spirited cars, designed by people who love cars, for people who love driving cars. This passion has made Porsche a true and enduring automotive legend. <laughs>